So welcome, it's good to see everyone. I am Alva Taylor, I'm a professor in the strategy uh, department here at Tuck, and I'm also faculty director of the Center for Digital Strategies. Uh, it's our pleasure to have Julie Brill here to have a, this discussion. Um, Julie has had a long and distinguished career in the public sector, both at the state uh, and the federal side, sort of culminating uh, in being the commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, just some things that were said about that, about Julie. The commission's most important voice on internet privacy and data security issues. A key player in national and international regulations. The top mind in online privacy, top 10 influencers on big data, and leading the data privacy debate. So she's, she went from that to now being at Microsoft. And as you see the title, and, I, and it was it's, back, it's one of the few things that I wrote down <laughs> because it's, it's she's long. corporate <laughs> vice president, deputy general counsel of global privacy and regulatory affairs Chief Privacy Officer. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the longest titles. It I've is. Ever it's seen ridiculous. Yes, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so all that really says is that she leads their their privacy and regulatory affairs for one of the biggest companies in the world, and they're probably working her too hard. <laughs> That's pretty much what that what that title says. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion for about thirty to forty minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. So. So now I gotta sit down because And we're having a fireside chat, as uh, you can there see. There we go. <laughs> so I just you know, you've served in the public sector for it's funny because in your bio it actually gives the years you served. It's so many I said, years. I said a long and distinguished. Decades. Right. So so you served uh, in the public sector and now you're at you're in the private sector yeah. um, with with Microsoft. As you think about that transition. What are some things that you would, now that you know, having worked in the private sector, that you wish you would have known as commissioner? Mm -hmm. And what are some things that you know as commissioner that you're trying to build into the thinking of Microsoft and you wish more private sector companies knew? Yeah, those are great questions. First, let me take two seconds to just thank you for having me, to thank Patrick. Um, this is, I think, my second time at Tuck. Um, last time I was here, I, there was another event and I gave a talk. And um, it's just a, just a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, have a home in Randolph, Vermont, which is not very far away. And it's just always really, really nice to come back. So thank you to, to Dartmouth and to you for having me here at Tuck. Um, so what, did, what, what do I wish um, I had known as a regulator that I now see inside Microsoft? Um, I'd say the biggest thing that I would uh, tell commissioners now, I do tell them now, or if I ever went back into government, I would bring with me as a result of my experience at Microsoft is this. Companies are always asking for more clarity, always. They, they say, we want to comply, we want to do the right thing, just tell us what we need to do. They want checklists. They want you know, really just detailed, tell us, tell us what we need to do. The regulators, on the other hand, and frankly, I was one of these, resisted giving those checklists and those, you know, here's all you need to do, because we were very worried that um, the next day, we'd realize we left one, two, three very important things off that list. In other words, it would bind us in a way that would reduce flexibility on the part of a regulator. Um, that is not a good way to approach regulation. Um, what I am seeing now, but in the privacy space in particular, but this is also true in other regulatory spaces, um, Europe is much more detailed about what they want. They're much more prescriptive about what they want. There's something called, I'm going to use some terms, but I'm also going to do a little bit of explaining because you never know, you know, some of you may just be popping in like who the heck is she and what's Microsoft and all that. <laughs> and others of you may actually like really know a lot about privacy. So I just going to try to, so Europe enacted something called the General Data Protection Regulation. It's been online for about 18 months or so. Um, before that, they had something known as the Privacy Directive 
which was a little bit looser. The GDPR is much more um, is 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 much more intense in the sense both of jurisdictional reach and a little bit in terms of its provisions. But because it sets out clearly what needs to be done, GDPR has become a conversation that has made its way to the C-suites of major corporations. CEOs, CFOs, uh, chief privacy officers, chief security officers, we talk about GDPR. Nobody talks about the FTC Act inside the C-suites. Nobody talks about the state mini FTC acts, both of which are they're pretty much the same. They say you can't be unfair, you can't be deceptive, you can't engage in unfair uh, methods of competition. Well, what does that mean? And that's where the regulators have been more reluctant than I think they should be to really have that specificity so that then the conversation could rise up like, okay, now we know what we need to do. Let's, like, let's figure out how we do this, how we bring this into our systems, how we bring this into our data. GDPR has done that and the US regulations have not really. I mean, it is true, people say, well, we don't wanna have a data breach. We don't wanna be the next Equifax. Or they say, we don't want to be the next Google or we don't want to be the next Facebook in terms of the, the, the um, consent orders that they have recently faced. But how do you implement that? What does that mean? So I think that that's a learning I would bring back to the regulators is, yes, of course we want flexibility. But if we really want to drive change before people reach our enforcement radar screen, we have to be more specific about what we want. Because otherwise, it's just like, okay, well, I guess we'll just have to give it to the lawyers and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. So that's the learning that I would bring back. What I th the, one of the many values that I bring to Microsoft, having been uh, for almost 30 years in government, is um, I help pierce their bubble. Um, one of the things, and some of you have, I think, probably worked at companies and internships. I know some of you have even worked at Microsoft. Um, all companies, this is not exclusive to Microsoft, but I think this is especially true of the tech industry. They kind of exist in a bubble. Um, their bubbles are being burst um, more and more because uh, they're learning that the outside world is asking a lot more questions about what they're doing, and they need to be much more sort of um, open and have discussions about that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But what I'm able to bring, I think, to people who are incredibly well-meaning, who really want to do the right thing, um, <clears throat> but again, they don't always know what that is, or they don't always know how to balance the risk of regulatory enforcement against the need to drive better business, I can bring in that outside, that semi-outside voice to say, look, this is the way regulators think about X. This is how they think about data. This is how they think about data tagging. This is how they think about de-identification. This is how they think about encryption, whatever the issue is. Or this is how they are thinking about AI and, um, or you know, facial recognition. And I, um, I think because of my history, you know, bring a lot of credibility when I bring those conversations inside and say we really need to be thinking twice, three times, maybe four times about how we are implementing something in order to ensure that the regulators, as well as the public, will really understand what it is that we're trying to communicate to them and that we, you know, we're deserving of, of their trust. Now, you, you talked about bursting that bubble or not having them live in a bubble. Um, consumers and individuals' views of data and privacy has been evolving, and it's evolving pretty quickly over the last couple of years. Yeah. How, do, how does Microsoft, how do, how do you think most people think about data and privacy and what it means to them as far as your customers? And how is Microsoft thinking about what that means? Yeah, you know, privacy has definitely evolved. There's no question. I mean, I've been, so when I began my career, I, uh, I was in the state attorney general's office in Vermont, um, which is why, you know, and I did that for many years and I was running consumer protection, privacy and antitrust with them. And you know, back then, um, you know, people thought about notice and choice, right? As long as you put something in a privacy statement, um, you as a company could go forward and do it because consumers were presumably um, on notice and they were presumably making a choice to proceed after they were after they read that you know hundred page whatever you know statement that you wrote or that your lawyers wrote. Um, 
I think, uh, you know, as more and more people went online, as much more of our lives became uh, digitally dependent as opposed to sort of, you know, offline, more and more people were realizing that that, that system's just broken. It's impossible for consumers to really monitor how each and every one of their services is using their data by looking at these, you know, legal documents. It's, 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 not, a, it's not an appropriate way to approach uh, privacy. So the next phase of privacy, which really kind of came in with GDPR and the lead up to GDPR, was uh, consumer control. We're gonna give more control to consumers. We're going to let them look at their data, uh, uh, have access to it, see if they want to correct it, see if they wanna delete it, um, or if they wanna port it and take it to some other service provider. That's the promise that GDPR um, provides to, to the world. And when you think about it, really, access to data is really not about privacy. It's about control. But it is also, I think, now a very big element of this bundle of rights that we think about when we think about privacy. So consumer con control has moved maybe from an outline issue to really becoming a center focus of privacy over the last three, four years. But as, as TechLash continues, as questions about the, not just how companies are using data, but their power, just overall power that large tech companies have, I think the conversation is gonna shift once again. And privacy is going to become part of a series of regulatory efforts that will involve competition, it will involve um, uh, trade, it will involve industrial policy. Um, in other regions of the world where you're going to see um, uh, policymakers, political leaders, and regulators all saying, we've got a problem, we need to fix it. Privacy and privacy regulations will be one tool, but it will be one tool that will be part of a whole bunch of other tools. And so I think we're gonna see much more regulatory effort around privacy, much, uh, much stronger um, laws, stronger rules and more enforcement than we have seen in the past. Now one of the things you mentioned it a little bit before, but the discussion has become broader than just data privacy, yes. but about trust, trust between consumers and companies. Absolutely. Is trust different in how Microsoft thinks about it? Um, and yeah. how, how, how does Microsoft think about, about the trust building trust, having consumers trust them as a company. Yeah, trust is a really important concept. I mean, in many ways we think, in Microsoft, we happen to think that the, um, the, the, the metrics and the, the, the view of trust is more important than how people view us about privacy. Because privacy is just one element of trust. Privacy, cybersecurity, you know, do you, is, is this company keeping my data secure? Um, if my kids have um, an accessibility issue or my relatives have an accessibility issue, can they use Microsoft's products and services? So accessibility is another metric or aspect of trust. We do measure, um, all companies are always looking at like how do their customers think about them on all sorts of different metrics. Um, we do measure privacy. How do people think about us as, in terms of whether we are treating data appropriately and giving them control over their data? We definitely measure that. But what we find is a better indicator that really seems to indicate like when people come to us, when they go to other companies, is the metric around trust. And so, um, and it's, you know, you can ask it as simply as, you know, which companies do you trust the most or rank these companies in the order in which you trust them? And everybody, you know, it's funny, um, people have different notions of privacy. To go back to your first question, you, know, you think about Louis Brandeis and what was he thinking about when he wrote some of his seminal work about privacy, seminal work that actually affected the entire world's view of privacy. He said, privacy was a right to be left alone. I think that is not, I, I would venture to say that for all of you sitting here, that is not how you think about privacy. You think about privacy as you wanna share your data with whom you wanna share it, and you don't want other people to get it and to see it and to do other things with it. And that's where privacy becomes an issue of control. Similarly with trust, like what does trust mean? Trust has gotta mean so many different things to so many different people, but that's okay. You can still measure it because, it, because 
whatever people think about trust, however they define it, they will go to the company that they trust the most. They will migrate there, however it's defined. So that's why we measure it. And again, it's a very, you know, privacy is just, is a very important aspect, but one aspect of it. Let's talk a little bit about your experiences here. So sure. probably you've had some challenges in the, in the short period of time that you've been there. Can you give us an example of so, so some challenges you've faced sure. around these issues and how you've, how you've handled them or how Microsoft has handled them? Sure. Yeah, no, it's a piece of cake. We're like, we got it, man. We're just... <laughs> no, so really, um, all, you know, Microsoft is a global company, so we have long had to comply with global privacy laws. Uh, but when GDPR came online uh, or was uh, going to become effective in um, May of 2018, there was a multi-year process at Microsoft to say, okay, this is going to be big. This is going to affect um, not just us, but all of our customers. Maybe I should just take one second to say, like, a lot of these big tech firms, you know, they're big. And we do have a lot of data, that's absolutely true, but there are different business models involved with the different tech firms. And that's actually pretty important in terms of how you approach some of these big problems. So Microsoft, we do have um, consumer-facing platforms. We have um, LinkedIn, uh, now GitHub. I don't know how many people realize that, but we actually own um, GitHub, um, Bing, um, Edge. So we have consumer-facing platforms. But really, the biggest part of Microsoft's business is on the enterprise side and on our cloud uh, side, where we um, help other um, companies in their compliance journey. We provide a platform for companies to deal with cybersecurity, to deal with compliance, to deal with e-evidence, to deal with privacy. So that is one of the reasons why, when GDPR was coming online, the CEO of um, Microsoft, Satya Nadella, said, we're going to make this a strategic effort. We are going to not only build a big, beautiful compliance mechanism inside Microsoft for our use, but we're also going to provide those solutions to our customers because they will need it too. So this was a multi-year effort. It started before I arrived. I arrived two years ago. It probably started like, excuse me, yeah, I arrived two years ago. The effort started two years before GDPR, so it was underway for about a year and a half before I got there. It involved every uh, engineering team in the company. I mean, we're talking about, you know, there's 140,000 employees at the company. I would say that there were probably about, mm, but it would, depending upon how you count, count it, there were probably 50,000 people that were touching the GDPR machine that we were building in some fashion or another. So we built technical infrastructure that would allow us to, in an automated way, because we need to do everything at scale. You know, we can't just call up someone in a room. We call her Molly because she's on my team. There is someone who you can ultimately call if you have a problem. That's not Molly, by the way. I'm looking at some Katie Sills who um, helps me with communications is here, but I, she knows who Molly is, so I looked at her. Um, you know, it's not like you can just call Molly and say, hey, we've got 10,000 data subject requests. We got, they all want to access their data. And oh, by the way, we have a deadline of 30 days unless we give them a specific reason as to why it's going to take 60 days more. I mean, you can't do that at scale. So we built a very robust internal machinery in order to pull data from everywhere that it existed in Microsoft when it was appropriate to surface that uh, to data subjects. Um, when I arrived at the company, um, you know, again, I'm new. I'm like walking around talking about privacy things. Engineers would come up to me and say, you know, I don't, I don't really understand Article 11 of GDPR. And, I, you know, there's this one paragraph there that says blah, blah, blah. And I, is that really right? I think it should mean blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Article 11? Which one is that? You know? <laughs> I mean, these people were so on top of what was going on with GDPR. It was, it was truly amazing. But, it, but, but it's challenging, right? I mean, you're trying to drive huge, a, a paradigm shift in a company to build an entire infrastructure that is about um, 
not just complying with the law, but demonstrating that you were doing it in a very robust and um, uh, impactful and trusted way. Um, we now are one of the only uh, major US companies that applies GDPR data subject rights globally. Again, going to our trust narrative, we say, look, if, if we, we say privacy is a fundamental human right, we've been saying that for a long time, it's right there on our websites. If it is indeed a fundamental human right, then you, it's really hard to say this really important thing that Europe enacted, well, we're only gonna apply it in Europe, right? Because if you believe that privacy is now about control of data and giving users control, then you have to apply these things globally. So we do. So we have a dashboard now that anyone can go to, to look at their data, to that is, access it, to delete it, to correct it. We've had over, <coughs> I think, latest numbers around 22 million people around the world go to our dashboard, <coughs> excuse me, to access their data. And very interestingly, <coughs> so sorry, I get so choked up about this. <laughs> it's such an important thing. No, so I'm just kidding. Give me one second, sorry. Um, it, what's so interesting is most people would say, oh yeah, that's all the Europeans. They're the ones who are going to the dashboard. Indeed, what is really interesting is Americans go there much more than anyone else. Amer this meme that Americans don't care about controlling their data, that, that aspect of privacy, it's just not true. Americans really do care about privacy. You all care about who's using your data, who's accessing it. I think the thing that most Americans find most frustrating is they have no idea how to go out, go about controlling their data. They have no idea how to do this. And so they're left thinking, I don't know, I don't know who has access. I don't know how I delete it. I don't know what to do. That's one of the biggest problems we face now. So we are trying through our dashboard and through other tools that we provide to really make this as intuitive as we can for users and then we also provide these solutions to our customers, big other big enterprises, Fortune 500 companies, and also you know some small companies too to help them comply. I mean, you talk about Americans. Do we know? Is it younger Americans, older Americans? Do, do we have any sense of who's actually paying attention to this? You know, I don't think we break. I don't think we in our data have broken it down by age. But that's a really good call out. We actually could do that. We, we could, um, uh, because you know, people when they sign up with their account, they have to give us a rough estimate of their age. We certainly know if they're under 18 or over 18, um, for sure. Uh, that would be really interesting. So we don't know that, um, but we do know that Japan, people in Japan are very active on our dashboard. Um, Canadians, very active. US, the most active. And then when you get to Europe, um, you know, the, the, t the countries that you would imagine are very concerned about data are indeed very concerned. UK, uh, Germany, France, uh, and, then, and then elsewhere. If you do it on a per capita basis, though, I think like Isle of Man tops the list because <laughs> they have like 10 people and all 10 of them go to our dashboard. <laughs> I hope none of you are from Isle of Man. <laughs> so you talked a little bit, I think you called it Tech Lash. Yes, of course. In, in the press, in the government, um, in books and talk shows, uh, there's been a sort of tech has been taken a task about lots of big companies have been taken a task yeah. about their use of data, their control of data, the, the misuse of data. How is that or has it changed how Microsoft views things and, and how has Microsoft responded to that? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, so y when you all were in grammar school or maybe well before then, um, you know, Microsoft went through some very tough times. Um, you know, it was the subject of a very deep antitrust scrutiny back in the 90s and early aughts. Um, and uh, I, when I was at the Vermont Attorney General's office, I led the Vermont's litigation against Microsoft, just as an example. I mean, it was um, uh, it, it was under a lot of scrutiny um, for various um, antitrust issues, but really sort of stemming from the amount of um, power it had over the operating system and what was being tacked on to the operating system and what was 
uh, what it was doing in terms of allowing other companies to seamlessly um, interface with the operating system. That's a very rough overview of what that was. So, so that, those were some tough times for Microsoft. But um, what was, what's really important about when you go through a tough time is what you learn from it. And what Microsoft gained from it, and in particular, the current CEO, who was there at the time but was not in the position of CEO, and also uh, the president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, who, is, who I report to directly, um, he, has, he was general counsel during many of these years. What the company and those two individuals in particular, but many, many other of the leaders learned is that, you know, yes, you fight when it's appropriate to fight, but when you know the regulators are right or there's really nothing more you can do, you need to make peace. And making peace, it's kind of like trust. Like what does peace mean? Peace really in many ways means that what you're gonna do is understand that you do have, a, you're a company that has a lot of power. You know, just recognize it and be honest about it. The Microsoft and these other companies, Microsoft says it, other companies should say, we do have a lot of power. We have a lot of responsibility. And we need to, we need to be responsible in terms of the amount of power we have and in terms of how we treat people. And so one of the things that Microsoft has, you know, we went through those, I, I, I went up and down. It's really, it was, was a nadir, right? It was really a low time. And it is now way up there in terms of um, how regulators and policymakers think about the company for several reasons. It is on, we try to be as honest as we can in our conversations, both in terms of recognizing responsibility and also trying to drive solutions, right? So having honest conversations, pr uh, proposing solutions, but recognizing that your solutions are just an idea. Like we don't necessarily have the right solution, but we wanna be part of, of helping develop solutions. So there's a couple of examples of this. Um, in the cybersecurity space, Microsoft was very involved in something called the Tech Accord, which was bringing companies together to indicate that they were going to work together to try to solve cybersecurity problems. We were very involved in the Paris call, which was being driven by um, President Macron in France, which was trying to bring together governments, NGOs, and companies to try to drive solutions around cybersecurity. Um, there's now a Christchurch call, which um, had to do with uh, digital safety um, as a result of the massacre that was basically filmed live um, in uh, Christchurch. So New Zealand has been a leader in trying to drive these solutions where tech companies, governments, and NGOs get together to say, okay, how are we gonna solve this? We've, we've got people live streaming, you know, murdering people. You know, that can't happen. So how are we gonna solve these problems? Um, Microsoft has always like, like, or has always been over the past, you know, 10 years at the center of these conversations. Facial recognition is another example. Facial recognition is a very powerful tool. Um, and it can be used in incredibly helpful ways. And at the same time, it can also be used in ways that are deeply harmful, that could lead to uh, discrimination and other problems either because the tech is, is off, it isn't, it isn't working well, it's, it's not yet fully accurate, or because it's used inappropriately. And so we're doing a lot of work, not only to ensure that our facial recognition APIs are as um, accurate as possible, but also to try to talk about what are the rules of responsibility that we wanna build around the use of this very, very powerful technology. So I think these are all, the reason I started with the antitrust case is because I think sometimes it's going to take like a really hard set of experiences to get to a place where you realize, okay, we, we've got to shift. We've got to, we've, we've got to really engage. Um, at least that seemed to be the case for Microsoft. I mean, um, Bill Gates, who's you know, one of the most trusted and respected uh, people on the planet right now, Back when he was running the company, he was pleased that he didn't have to go to Washington, D.C. He was pleased that they didn't, at that time, have a Washington office. He doesn't feel that way now, and he thinks that Microsoft is absolutely on the right path because, because we engage.
Now let's, let's shift a little bit. So many of our students, they're, they're going to go and be um, product managers in companies. They're going to be business yep. leaders in companies. They're going to be entrepreneurs. What, what advice would you give them? What mindset, what perspective should they have in developing their products, de developing their business, starting their companies around these issues? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great call out. So I, I could say the thing that they need more than anything else is making sure they have a, a, a strong uh, budget. <laughs> Advocate for yourself. Um, but no. The, um, one of the ways to deal with all of these issues, whether it's accessibility, security, privacy, um, even now what's going to become um, this, uh, this new pillar around digital safety, you know, to the extent that you're dealing with platforms that are you know, allowing for uh, users to post videos and things like that. Um, what you really want to do is be think you want to think about these things from the beginning. One of the, th that is, and, and in privacy we call it privacy by design. In the security space they call it security by, by design. You know, just really thinking from the beginning about these issues. And I can say that, um, you know, when I dealt with at the FTC, uh, when I deal with at Microsoft, some of our customers, the ones that have older systems that we call legacy systems, in other words, they were built in another age, they weren't built for the cloud, just as an example, or they certainly weren't built for compliance uh, with something like GDPR or even the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is about to come online, um, they have a much harder time because you have to retrofit an old system to new, to new rules. What you, what you really want to do when you're thinking about privacy by design and security by design is you want to build as much flexibility into the system that you're designing because new laws will come down the road. You don't want to just build to GDPR or just build to CCPA. That's the California Consumer Privacy Act. People call it CCPA. You don't want to just build to those. You want to have enough dials and knobs in your system so that as Brazil modifies its law, as India finalizes its law, because all these regions are also enacting privacy laws and security laws, China, absolutely, to the extent that you want to and are able to engage. So you want to build enough dials and knobs in your system so that you can adjust depending upon the particular geo that you're acting in. That would be, I think, uh, the, the most important thing I'd say that you could do now is as you're design, as you go in, assess your team, assess the product, assess what you're doing, and if you don't have that capability, build it right away. You know, that's, that should be P0, as we say. Priority, you know, first order priority to get that done. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna, I got a couple more questions, but I'm yes, gonna open it up. I wanna, I, I wanna let uh, other people have a chance to ask questions. Are there any questions out there? Any questions? Yes. Sure. And I may repeat the question because I think they're videotaping. So I'll, unless, do, do we have mics for, oh, we, there we go. Excellent. Great. Um, so I think a lot of people are very skeptical sometimes um, when companies talk about sort of self-regulating and the industry talks about we're going to engage between ourselves and solve some of these problems. Because a lot of people think companies will do sort of just enough um, to, to skate by and to make sure trust is at a sufficient level um, to not lose business. So how do you see that from sort of both the regulator side and um, the corporate side and how do you view that criticism? It's a great, great question and it, it allows me to sort of clarify some of the stuff I was talking about. So thank you for asking it. When I was um, both uh, in assist, well, all three, assistant attorney general in Vermont, and then I went to North Carolina, and I ran their programs there, and then at the FTC, I was skeptical about self-regulation, somewhat for the reasons that you were talking about. Um, I felt that um, often it would do either just enough or it wouldn't even do just enough, um, but it was you know, an effort to avoid regulation, actual regulation. Um, one of the perspectives that Microsoft has and that I have, um, uh, which is why they brought me there, um, is that we do need laws. We do need laws. And Microsoft is uh, very supportive of a strong federal privacy law. We've been advocating for a law on fa facial recognition. 
Um, we think that, uh, you know, there are areas that it's, if you don't have a law in place, it's a race to the bottom, right? And we think that that race to the bottom in terms of companies competing to get as much business as they can without building the most protections in as they can is not what, where society should go. And that's what I was saying about that arc of, that, the, of what Microsoft has gone through, I think, has led them to the place where they understand that actually regulations have a really uh, important value. And some of that value is really salutary um, in terms of understanding where your data is, you know, uh, uh, data hygiene, the, the kinds of things that you have to go through to get ready for GDPR, enormous data hygiene all around the company to really be able to surface someone's data, just as an example. Facial recognition, too. So, no, we, we've really um, been advocating for laws. The problem is policymakers don't act very quickly. Um, people, some people have been calling for a federal privacy law, well, since the late 90s, it went away for a little while, but now it's back. Um, <clears throat> I am unfortunately not convinced that there will be a federal privacy law, certainly not before November 2020. I, I don't wish that to be the case. It's just looking at the way things are developing in DC. States have been enacting privacy laws because they can often move more quickly. They're a little bit more agile. Um, and so you see California, Washington State is also looking at a privacy law. There are other states that are doing things. Um, so we're, we're working with any policymaker that will put in place a strong privacy law or a strong facial recognition law. So the problem is they don't act fast. So if they're not acting quickly, you know, you got to do something. So what we do and what companies are doing is we're saying, well, here's the code we're going to abide by. So everybody knows this is what we're saying we're going to do for facial recognition or for privacy, whatever. Um, and, and lots of other companies, I'm sure, are doing that too. So I think at the end of the day, yes, in many of these areas, you just need laws. And we're deeply supportive of that. But it's that interstitial space that has to be filled. You can't, you can't leave a vacuum. And that's why you come in and you sort of say, OK, we're going to have the Paris call. We're going to, on cyber, you're going to have uh, pillars around facial recognition, things like that. It's a great question, and it's a, it's a hard one. It's a hard one. Thanks, and, and really appreciate your, uh, your being here today. So, and this is, I think, not a question that would have been asked in the same way maybe three or four years ago, but um, it seems like there are increasingly discussions among sort of large tech companies uh, about the way companies think about regulation within countries, but then the way companies think about uh, sort of regulation, sovereignty, and morality across national borders. So yes. for instance, um, products that may be developed in a certain country that would be things like facial recognition or certain types of data that could be used very differently in a, say, totalitarian state versus in a democratic state. Um, it, projects that may impact or, or be for the, the military of a certain country. And so I'm curious, as a global company, how does Microsoft think about navigating those waters and sort of balancing uh, good regulatory relations with the fact that, that Microsoft is a, an American company um, with its own sort of moral code as to what it will and won't do? I realize that's very broad, but... No, it's, a, it's another great question, and in some ways it actually builds on the last one. Um, so <clears throat> you're absolutely right. Um, uh, we, we are a global company, but we're also an American company. So for instance, some of our um, biggest customers are the U.S. Army um, the uh, various uh, elements of the military establishment, et cetera. And we're proud of that. You know, we're proud that our products and services are helping protect you know, the men and women on the front line um, in any battlefield. Um, and we also uh, are asked by lots of governments around the world to provide them with some very powerful tools. And so to the last quest question, you know, what we have to do is build a set of internal criteria, which are essentially human rights criteria. When are we going to provide to, you know, a country X uh, something like facial recognition when we know what, what their score is in terms of some of the most, you know, highly respected NGOs in terms of human rights um, abuses? 
when we know what their implementation plan is, um, you know, we have said no. We've had to say no because it was the morally right thing to do and also it violated these principles that we have. Um, <clears throat> but again, one of the things that, that we start to worry about is that race to the bottom where, okay, we're not gonna supply country X, but then the next guy down the road with you know, facial recognition technology will. And so then our engineers and the people who own that P&L, profit and loss, you know, it's in their little vertical, they come to us and say, hey, you know, your human rights things, oh, that's great and what, wonderful, but I just lost a big sale, right? So that's one of the reasons why it's really important to get those laws on the books. But no, it's absolutely the case that um, it's really important for companies, and, and, and Microsoft absolutely does this, and I don't believe we're the only ones that, that really um, will push through some of these very sensitive projects and proposals through that human rights um, screen to make sure that we, um, we think that it will be, the, the very powerful technology will be used in an appropriate way. There was a question over. Yeah, over yeah. there. Yeah, as a former regulator, it's so interesting to hear that that concern about clarity just takes place across the government. And so one of the things, speaking of clarity, that we heard a lot was that the lack of clarity was hurting innovation, where a company did not want to get out in front of where the regulation would be. Yeah. And that obviously benefits larger companies and then also sometimes the smaller ones that are just going to you know, ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Right. So my question on that is, given that regulation is slow and moves in fits and starts, what is your opinion or sort of position on regulatory sandboxes or policies that could encourage innovation? Because with yeah. privacy especially, it's a kind of odd area to be yeah, yeah. in, but is there a place for it? Where were you a regulator? I was at CFPB, um, so oh. we worked with STC um, some of the time Very well. interesting, very interesting. Talk about an agency that's changed. Um, there's actually some, re I w that, there's some really interesting discussion one can have about agency design, comparing the FTC and the CFPB and how it got set up. And I was involved in some of those discussions back when the CFB, CFPB was being formed. Put that aside because that's not your actual question. Um, I think uh, regulatory sandbox are sandboxes are interesting. I assume everybody kind of knows what we're talking about. It's sort of, Why don't you explain so, regulatory sandbox? I will, and, and I think um, part of it is that not every um, regulator will treat a sandbox the same way. So for instance, the UK's um, Information Commissioner's Office, known as the ICO, has um, a regulatory sandbox where they invite companies to come in and um, basically sort of demonstrate and talk about their new products and services to kind of go through an assessment by the um, ICO about where that will sort of land in terms of GDPR and, 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 its, uh, and whether it will sort of meet the, meet the regulatory requirements or not. CFPB, I think, did have some regulatory sandboxes um, as well. Um, <clears throat> I um, think that the ICOs, I do, I'm not as familiar with how many people participated in the CFPBs, but I have a feeling the experience was probably the same. Um, not very many companies went forward and you know, provided you know, to the regulators a demonstration of something that was about to come online or that was in incubation. Um, in part because uh, they wanted to go to market, they didn't want to have that stumbling block, but also, um, you know, it would have been, it would have provided a lot of really great information, but one wouldn't have known, like, okay, now we've sort of, we've, 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 you know, we could use the word open, the phrase open dark kimono, or we could say, you know, we've got, they've looked behind the screen. Um, and, you know, that gives, that gives the regulator a lot of information, a lot of power, and just as with privacy, you want to know who is controlling your data and what they're going to do with it. One, I think, often wondered what the ICO would really do um, if you did go ahead and launch that product and, and uh, maybe didn't listen to everything they said. So I think it's, it's a great idea in, in theory. I think it's a great idea. I think it shows a lot of openness on the part of the particular regulator to do it. Um, the FTC and the DOJ have a Similar process, they don't call it a sandbox, but what they do is they allow companies to write letters and say, if company A was going to do X, Y, and Z with company B, would that violate the competition laws? You know, so there are these processes that are in place. I just don't think they get used that much because people are really worried about what, what they'll hear. 
Um, but I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea, and I, I'd like to see more folks use it. Um, we at Microsoft, we have not used the um, ICO's regulatory sandbox. So, it was that the experience at the CFPB? Did you get a lot of people coming in? Sure. Exactly. And that's especially true in the air in the financial area, right? Because yeah, 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 yeah. it's interesting. Good. Question back there. Yeah. So um, the bad behavior or less than ideal behavior of some tech companies. Yeah. The less than ideal behavior of some tech companies kind of casts a poor light on the entire industry. So, from Microsoft's perspective, how do you? Either how do you interact with your counterparts at other players that are under a lot of scrutiny, or with their boards, or you know, man, CEO to CEO? It's it's a two part question. That's part one. Part two is, do you think that the dual class voting structure has hindered some companies from making progress here, because oh, the CEOs who have the voting power have too much control, and the boards have less control? Really interesting. Um, with respect to the first question, um, it, it is true that you know while Microsoft may not be like in the crosshairs of uh, in a regulatory sense at all, um, when the tech industry is in the crosshairs, it does have uh, you know a reverberating effect on trust and on reputation. Um, so we do spend a lot of time working with our counterparts for precisely that reason. Um, that happens at all different levels. It, it, it does happen CEO to CEO, just conversations like, hey, you guys have been through this, you know, tell, tell us what we should do kind of thing, um, to uh, engaging in things like the Tech Accord, like other efforts to try to drive sort of industry solutions so that um, there's, you know, we're in a trusted space, and also we, we understand that we're not racing to the bottom. So going back to the question about human rights and, and countries, you know, when you think about it, Microsoft passing on something, if someone else provides it, it's just a terrible, it's a lose-lose from, it's a, it's a win for Microsoft in terms of human rights, but, but it's a lose for the business. And so getting some coherence among companies around those human rights values is also something that would be really helpful. Um, so we do do it. I mean, we like to you know, differentiate ourselves, say, look, we've got a different business model. You heard me say that. Um, business models really matter um, as much as data use. Um, and so we are differentiated in many ways, and we obviously point that out. But, um, but your, your point is well taken. And um, the other thing about one of the reasons why you want to sort of get the industry as in as good a place as possible, especially, if, and it, it's especially easier when we're coming from a place where we're not in the regulatory crosshairs right now. Um, you want to make that happen because any one of us could be in the regulatory crosshairs tomorrow, right? I mean, it's, you know, there's lots, the, these laws are very um, uh, uh, big and complex and, uh, some of them are, the regulators are still figuring out what they mean. So as that process moves forward, we could find out that we made an interpretation that we thought was super reasonable, but it, it's no longer the interpretation that the regulators have, or they just decided because they've just figured out, uh, that's not the way we think we should go. So I think it is important to sort of focus on the industry as a whole, and Microsoft definitely tries to do that. And we're often viewed as you know, one of the adults in the room because we have this ability to reflect um, at, not in a place of emergency, but in a place of, you know, yes, we, we think these are really important issues, and let's think about the long term. Um, <clears throat> your issue about um, the, the uh, you know, dual stock, the, the two levels of stock, is a, is a really good one, and I've thought a lot about that. Um, I do think that has an effect. I think um, having founders that are in control, you know, and they, they, they basically set up the company, they are super successful, and they're still in control is, you know, it makes, it makes change harder. 
because they were very successful. So I do think that has an impact. Have, it's interesting you were saying about um, sort of lessons shared. Have yeah. you ever made the phone call, what are you doing, are you crazy? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> I haven't made it like that. Um, actually, what I've gotten is the phone call to me saying, Julie, what do I do? You know, what do you, what, what are you, what do you recommend? What are you guys doing? I've gotten a lot of those phone calls. I am, um, you know, I, I mean, just like every other sector, you know, people know, everybody knows everybody else. And I know, I do know a lot of people both in the regulatory space as well as now in the business space. Um, people seek my advice a lot. Yeah, but no, I haven't, I, you know, maybe I should do that. I don't know, <laughs> I'll think about that a little bit more. Do, like when you, uh, I was gonna get, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't want you to squeal on other people. Oh, okay. So, okay. any other questions? <laughs> any other questions? Uh, there, yeah. right straight back. We've got time for about, about one more question. Um, so my question involves innovation. So how do you innovate in an environment where uh, where privacy edge cases are not really being thought of? So for instance, this has come up a lot with like new technology being built and then uh, being built for one purpose and then being used for another purpose that it wasn't intended to be used for. Yeah. But like you couldn't have predicted that. Right. So then the companies now punish for that right. that that usage, even though you know, they couldn't have thought of that because it's a new technology. Right, right. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a really good answer for that other than to try to do what I described before, really building in those, you know, as many um, dials and knobs as you can early on so that when you learn that secondary uses of the product or the data um, <clears throat> are troubling, you can dial back, you can change things. There's, there is an example of that. It's a little bit orthogonal to the one that you, you provided, but around voice data. Um, so uh, you all may know that there were a number of um, articles uh, that came out when um, it was discovered that companies that are providing um, voice solutions, um, whether it's Alexa or Cortana or whatever, or Siri, whatever, um, <clears throat> they, they test their, their um, systems by using snippets of human voice. And those snippets are de-identified, they're decoupled. But in order to really make sure that the system works well, you have it done in an automated way. You know, a computer is listening to the snippet and trying to transcribe it. But you need humans to check that transcript. And so there suddenly was a lot of controversy that humans were looking at voice snippets. And the problem was, were they, were they truly de-identified? Did they have a personal information in them that snuck through? Those were very valid questions. And so everybody sort of stopped what they were doing in the tech industry and, and, and redesigned what they were doing. Um, but that was something that was unexpected because it was actually thought that people would want to have human review, um, that human review would be helpful for the service but also that we had sufficient protections around it, and um, we learned that uh, we learned that the, the the bar was moving, and that we needed to move with the bar. Great. Just if you had a magic wand, what yeah. would you change? If I had a magic wand, what would I change right now? I would say let's get in place a federal privacy law right now. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's the one I would change. So that's, that's the, the time we have now. I want to great. say thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you. It was great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that's sweet. Thank you. Thank you. It was really great. Great questions. Thanks, everybody.